Hello and welcome to lecture 28 where we'll be discussing fossil algae. This is Utah State University's Geology 6350 Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany class and I am Benjamin Berger. So algae is part of a group a kingdom called the Protista. And the Protista is actually a number of different groups within the Protista that are monophyletics or true groups within uh, the Protista group of algae. These are all eukaryotic organisms, which means that they have uh, larger, more complex cells. Now there's a number of groups we're going to be talking about. The first group is the Chlorophyta, which is oftentimes referred to as the green algae. And the Chlorophyta uh, green algae is the most closely related group to the kingdom Plantia, the uh, plants, the vascular plants that we have uh, around us today. But there's some other groups of algae that are more distantly related to plants. Those also include the cryosophyta, the golden brown algae, which also includes the diatoms. Pyrophyta, these are the dinoflagellates, um, sometimes referred to as the fire algae. And then we have the ferrophyta. The ferrophyta are the brown algaes. And then we have the rhodophyta. These are the red algaes. So let's take a look at each one of these groups and talk a little bit about their fossil history. So the rhodophyta are the red algaes, and they probably have the best fossil record of all the algae groups that we'll be discussing today. They are encrusting sort of algaes that you oftentimes find uh, in marine zones. Um, sometimes they can become fairly uh, large in size, and if you look in many uh, coral uh, reef ecosystems, you oftentimes find the red algaes. The red algaes are um, eukaryotic organisms. They are capable of photosynthesis is how they make their living, um, oftentimes encrusting in various areas, and they have unique shape and quite beautiful actually. Now, rhodophyta, you oftentimes will find um, these red algaes along beach deposits. Um, they oftentimes will wash up on shore. Um, and uh, if you turn over rocks, they can kind of encrust or sort of lock into a rock to kind of hold them. Um, but oftentimes they don't have necessarily any vasculature in them, so they don't exist within uh, the terrestrial realm, within air. They quickly deflate. They don't have any of the structure that you see with uh, modern plants that can hold them upright. Now, red algae are actually pretty important for uh, human consumption. Um, here are some children in Japan they're making nori, algae that you can eat and is used in wrapping up sushi. Also red algae is often uh, used in making agars that are used for uh, cultures of bacteria that can grow on them, uh, composed of the very thick membranes of the cells of these eukaryotic organisms. Now the red algaes form a very distinct and unique eukaryotic lineage. They have um, accessory uh, photosynthetic pigments that give them that deeper red color. They lack phalangelia. These are the little whirling um, tails that you see in some of the groups of algae that we'll talk about. And they also lack uh, centrioles. Um, this is also found in many of the other higher plants uh, such as uh, angiosperms and some of the gymniosperms that lack the centrioles. Um, they're only found oftentimes in the male gametes. Um, they have uh, chloroplasts that have chlorophyll A, um, and so they only have chlorophyll A. There's a couple other types of chlorophyll that we'll talk about later on. So they have sort of a more primitive group of, of chlorophyll. The uh, most important thing as a paleontologist is that red algae form are called chlorine sort of buildups. Um, they are one of the few groups that actually of algae that compose a uh, have sort of a skeleton, a very thick membrane, and that is built up of calcium carbonate that's developed in their cell walls. And that calcium carbonate is enough to actually become a, sort of a reef building sort of structure. And so red algae is the only group of algaes that can actually build up sort of reef deposits because of the abundance of this calcium carbonate. And that's in part because they have a very thick wall. Now, rhodophyta can be recognized quite readily in the fossil record. And if you're looking at many limestone outcrops and looking at the petrology, looking at the rocks and thin section and shining light through it, um, oftentimes you can recognize this red algae that's growing in these colonial reef type forms where it's encrusting. And here you can see one of 
the distinguishing ways you can tell it in a thin section is that it has this very unique pattern of having sort of lots of little kind of squares in there of each of those cellular membranes that's there. And each one of those cellular membranes is composed of a thick cellular wall of calcium carbonate. And so you can get these sort of encrusting patterns that you see. And they differ quite dramatically from, say, stromatolites and other sort of encrusting things you might see in corals in having this very sort of grid-like nature to them as they're encrusting. And oftentimes they'll encrust around a coral. Um, they may encrust around some gastropods or, or some sort of other uh, um, organism that you might see in thin sections. So they're all oftentimes encrusting, uh, composing a layer that's going to kind of hold that uh, that structure down. Now the other amazing thing about rhodophylla is they have a fossil record that goes way back. One 1.2 billion years into the past. And many of these very early forms look very similar to forms that we have living today. So this is an example of a fossil that um, was discovered at 1.2 billion years ago, or 1,200 million years ago. And this is a modern uh, red algae that we can find today. And comparing the two, they're very, very similar in their makeup. The next group we're going to talk about are the chlorophyta. These are the green algaes. Now these are the group that's most closely related to uh, land plants. Chlorophyta have chloroplasts that are composed of two types of chlorophyll, um, A and B. And this is also seen in living um, land plants today. The other interesting thing about chlorophyta is that they have phalangium. Um, so they have these bits of uh, long sort of structures that whip around that give them some mobile abilities to move around. So a lot of times these groups are ciliated and so they can uh, move around in the water column. Although other chlorophyta will actually sort of anchor themselves down in uh, the water and, and develop sort of a uh, more multicellular sort of makeup. They have um, many of the t typical complex structures that you see in eukaryotic uh, cells. Now chlorophyta has a pretty good fossil record. Part of that is because many of the different groups of chlorophyta produce calcium carbonate, and so they're able to produce some hard parts that you actually see in the fossil record. They're one of the very first groups to actually colonize and get into the freshwater systems. And so uh, the green algae um, get into the freshwater systems, and you oftentimes see the uh, chlorophyta living in uh, freshwater systems today. There are a couple interesting fossils that become extremely common because the chlorophyta actually produce fairly hard structures. One of the common groups that you see in the fossil record are the chorophytas. Chorophytas produce these pods that are extremely hard, made out of calcium carbonate, and they fossilize really well. And we have a fossil record that goes all the way back to the um, early Devonian. Oftentimes, people will buy these at uh, pet stores for their aquariums. And so these produce stone warts. These are little capsules that basically um, pre are preserved because they're confound, composed out of calcium carbonate. So the next group we're going to talk about are the ferrophyta, the brown algaes. This group is mostly marine. And the best known um, brown algae are the kelp, uh, kelp forests that are found off the coast of California, for example. Now, the Phenophyta have chloroplasts that are surrounded by actually four membranes. So they have some extra membranes around the chloroplasts. Um, this structure is called the thallus, which is the name of the, 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 the structures. So a little bit more hardy in their makeup. Um, they also produce these things called pneumatocysts. The pneumatocysts are these air bladders. And this increases the buoyancy. And so what the brown algae does is to get up into that photic zone is they actually produce these air bladders that allow them to float. And so they float up into the photic zone and they're able to stay in the photic zone. And instead of having vascular to um, woody sort of stalks to them, they have these uh, air bladders and that makes them very um, able to get up into the photic zone to get that sunlight for photosynthesizing. So these giant, huge kelp forests that you see off the coast of California, for example, all belong within this group of brown algae. Now the fossil record, um, the earliest sort of record that we have of brown algae goes back to the earliest edition. 
possibly older. It's a little bit difficult to tell these apart from the rhodophyta that have a more extensive fossil record. Um, and so some of these earlier forms are a little bit problematic in determining whether they actually belong within the brown algae group. Once you get up into the tertiary in the last 65 million years, you have a much better uh, fossil record of some of these kelp beds, uh, particularly along the uh, Pacific coast here in North America. And so we have some definitely wonderful fossil records of some of these brown algaes once you get up into the Cenozoic in the last 65 million years ago in the tertiary. The next group we're going to talk about, the Cryosophyta. These are the golden brown um, algae or the diatoms. Most of these are microscopic and they live in fresh water. One of the interesting things about these, um, especially the diatoms, is that they secrete um, uh, these resting cysts of silica. So they're composed of sort of a, a silica of glass. And so these are the things that are oftentimes picked up in the fossil record. They originated during the Cretaceous, which means they're a fairly recent addition um, to our uh, groups of algae. Um, they're unicellular, so they're only single-celled organisms. Now, the diatoms are often placed in a group called the Bicillarophyta, um, and these all secrete silica. So instead of calcium carbonate, silica. Silica is a little bit more resistant, a little harder, and so it, it uh, is able to uh, form these skeletons, and they're fairly rigid. And they can be prepped out using simple acids like um, hydrochloric acid to dissolve out the calcium carbonate. And it preserves these beautiful um, silica um, casings. Um, they originate in the Cretaceous. They're unicellular. Um, you find them in marine uh, freshwater. They're very common in freshwater lakes and ponds. You can actually even find them existing in soils. Um, they're often used in determining uh, environmental reconstructions, uh, biostratigraphy that you see in freshwater systems. They're very commonly studied. Um, oftentimes they're used to see how the, uh, the lake is changing in terms of salinity, in terms of pH mm -hmm. over time. Now the thing that I love about diatoms in this group is that they form these extremely beautiful uh, skeletons made out of silica that um, preserve really well in the fossil record uh, simply by putting your limestone units into an acid bath and extracting the remaining silica you can get some beautiful images. These are all SEM scanning electron microscope images of various diatoms huge diversity of these groups and just very beautiful sort of geometric shapes the result and so there's tons of different morphologies that you can use to identify these diatoms oftentimes they're kind of long and more cyl uh, cylindrical in shape and here's some of the great diversity of many of these different diatoms that you find in the fossil record the next group are the Pyrophyta. The pyrophyta are the dinoflagellates. Um, sometimes you refer to them as dinocysts. These are flagellated protists, so they have flagellate um, that move around. And they include some groups that are zooanthia. These mean that they are in a symbiotic relationship with the cnidarian corals. So the cnidarian corals that uh, have these basically kind of harbor them, these photosynthesize, um, live within the coral and basically the, the corals will feed on them and let them grow and so they're able to kind of survive. Dinoflagellates are also responsible for the red tides that you may have heard about. These are the big algal blooms that happen and I'll talk a little bit more about those red tides. The weird thing about the dinoflagellates is they have a very complicated sort of DNA structure intermediate between sort of the circular structure that we saw in prokaryotes and sort of these strain sort of characteristics that you see with many other groups of um, plants and animals. Um, it's been suggested that this is actually maybe a more derived characteristic. So they have some very weird genetic sort of structure. They have chloroplasts that have chlorophylls of A and a different type called C2. So they have two different types of chlorophylls within their chloroplasts. One of the weirdest things I think about dinoflagellates is that they also eat other organisms. So not only do they photosynthesize, but many groups can actually sort of go over and consume other uh, organisms. So they kind of have a, a dual relationship. They're both um, primary producers and secondary consumers, which is kind of makes them sort of unique. They compose their, uh, their cells out of cellulose. So this gives them uh, the ability to be preserved 
in the fossil record. Some of them actually have internal silicate parts. That means that they're made out of silica um, on the inside. Um, and these oftentimes are little stars and little clusters that can be found in the fossil record. Now, the pyrophyta, the diophylagellates, one of the weird things that they do is they reproduce uh, sexually. So they float around in the, in the uh, water column. Uh, two of them will meet. They will mate. They will lay eggs down. And then those eggs oftentimes hatch in a great cloud. Um, and so you get these big blooms of dinoflagellates that happen along a coastline. One of the things that's been happening with these is that there's been more and more nutrients, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, they're making it into the, into the ocean waters, the coastal waters, where many of these uh, exist. And they are proliferating at a great rate. And so you get these big, huge algae blooms. These are referred to as red tides because many of these dinoflagellates have kind of a red tone. And so when you have an ocean that's just full of these, it turns sort of the ocean kind of reddish in color. Now the scary thing about um, uh, these algae blooms is that many of these dinoflagellates um, produce a uh, toxin called uh, saxotoxin, which is a poisonous, very poisonous. I mean, it's one of the more poisonous uh, substances that's out there. And so if you ingest or breathe in some of these uh, dinoflagellates, you can get poisoned from them. You can also get poisoned by eating shellfish, which is how most people die in these red algae blooms. They'll eat the uh, various uh, shellfish, the mussels and things that are the filter feeding, and they take in this, this toxin into them. And this toxin is really a uh, powerful toxin. It affects the um, sodium channels within the nerve cells. So it disrupts the way in which nerves communicate with each other. There's actually a couple of researchers here at Utah State um, University here in Vernal, Utah, at the Uinta Basin campus, that's actually doing research on some of these toxins that are produced by the dinoflagellates. The other really cool thing about um, the dinoflagellates has to be that they have the capability of being bioluminescent. That means that they can produce light um, this is produced within each of the cells. It's agitated by mechanism. So oftentimes, if you go down to a beach where there's waves crashing, you'll see where the waves that are moving, that they start to have this bioluminescence um, and giving off color. It's not that this has evolved as a way of a warning, um, also sort of to distract predators, maybe some fish or filter feeding um, organisms that are out there to sort of distract them. They're also kind of used as sort of a, a, a signal to the other um, cells that are out there to get away and to kind of try to swim away from whatever predator is out there. So kind of a burglar system or sort of signal to other, um, to other dinoflagellates. Um, one of the cool fun things I've, I've done is if you go out into the ocean, and I used to do this in Long Island Sound, and you go swimming at night, and you move the water, uh, with that movement of the water, it'll start to create this bioluminescence. And so oftentimes if you s swim out in quiet water, some of these lagoonal places in like Jamaica, um, but even in New York, you'd swim out and you can shake up the water and you can see this bioluminescence, this color coming off the dinoflagellates. So you can't see them, but uh, you can see the, the luminescence that they produce at night. And they only produce it at night, or at the end of the night, they produce less and less of this. They kind of run out of the, the chemicals they're using in their bioluminescence colors. Now, the fossil record of dinoflagellates is a bit interesting. Um, we have evidence of fossil cysts that extend back into the Silurian, though the vast majority of dinoflagellates appear in sort of the Jurassic and into the Cretaceous. In fact, um, dinoflagellates are very useful for biostratigraphic relationships once you get into the Jurassic, Cretaceous, and into the tertiary. Um, and you can actually study them. A lot of people study them to try to kind of look at biocorrelation with the dinoflagellates and also work out their phylogeny. Um, and there's been a lot of papers published in dinoflagellates of, of recently. Um, the other weird thing about dinoflagellates, if you look at them, they appear to uh, resemble very closely in sort of their morphology some of these acrotards that are found in the Neoproozoic and the Precambrian, uh, very early um, fossil record that, for example, we have here in northeastern Utah in the Uinta Mountain Group, these Neoproozoic rocks. And so there's some 
suggestion that's out there that these might be related to the dinophylagellates. So they may have a much more extensive fossil record going all the way, all the way back into the Precambrian. But most of the groups that we know of today that are true dinophylagellates appear in sort of the middle part of the Mesozoic. All right, that ends our lecture on fossil algae. I will see you next time.